Hello, I'm Luke McIntyre from Matter, and with me today is John Thompson. Hey everyone. So today we're going to talk a little bit about decentralized identity. We're going to talk about the capability in general. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive back into the brief history of the internet and digital identity on the internet and some of the challenges that we, we see with that, but also some of the opportunities, the large opportunities that have been created. So decentralized identity brings us a whole bunch of new capability. And we're going to understand that in the context of organizations and also individuals. And then we're going to look at matter. So matter's role in this and what do we do to enable these uh, types of technologies to come to life, right, and, and solutions. So matter is a technology company in the decentralized identity space, and we build tools for developers to enable the, the things we're talking about today. So John, from a customer perspective, conversations we have today about digital identity and some of the challenges we see on the internet today, I wonder if you can walk us through what those typically would be and what those conversations entail. Yeah, so what we found is that organizations have always needed a way to understand who they are interacting with. And I think a traditional way of doing that was that people would set up accounts with those organizations, have a username and password associated with it. And um, once they've done that, then they would obviously have lots of different usernames and passwords with different companies, and that can kind of keep growing exponentially. And then very quickly, um, we kind of moved on and things like OpenID Connect have come along as a protocol to help people just set up one account and then organizations just had to interact with that one centralized place. So that's giving you that kind of array of sign-in options that you see today when you go to most websites where you've got sign-in with and several different options. Then you've also got username and password because I'm imagining you'd also have other challenges with that in terms of the behaviors that would be learned by those providers, the privacy concerns that would create. That's right, yeah. And I think that's one of the real risks that we're starting to see coming out of this kind of model. So um, because we have those centralized places where all those that user information is stored and every time they log into a website, it gives them a lot of opportunity for them to do tracking. Um, and there's other, you know, real privacy concerns there. And I feel like as a user, you become quite tethered to these services. And the idea of taking some of the information and porting it across different domains seems difficult. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So really, the user in these models, uh, they don't, they're not in control of their own data. You know, they have accounts, but they're set up with a particular provider, and it's a very sort of centralized place where they're all kept. And really getting that information out and being able to transfer to another provider is um, almost impossible. Right, so this is the promise of uh, decentralized identity, right? Is that we now have some new standards for expressing, sort of representing and transferring data between different domains and, and sort of more portable identities, I guess. I think that's the key thing for all of this, yeah. By making people have their own credentials that they can control and own themselves, it also allows them to use them across, as you say, different domains. And as long as everyone's using a standardized data model, then that's uh, much easier. So what types of credentials could be shared in this cross-domain model? There's a whole different range. Um, everything from, we've got proof of address credentials that can be issued, training certificates, even employee credentials for people inside your own organization. And presumably it's not just about the individual as a holder, it could be a business holding their own credentials as well. So business to business uh, credentials being transferred. Yeah, a really good example of that is invoices. We can actually see that invoice could go inside a credential and sent through to another organization and it'll be a fully verified transaction. So one thing that really stands out to me here is, is the difference in roles. So it seems like we have someone in the middle that is the center of this transaction that actually the information relates to. Traditionally, we've always had uh, the concept of issuers, so people who are obviously creating the information and, and sending it out. Uh, and verifiers, or sometimes known as relying parties, who are taking that information and sort of using it in their current context. Um, but really now in the decentralized model, we're introducing this third role, which is what we call the holder. And it's really the person, the subject of the information that the credential is, is holding. And it puts them in a real active position as, as part of that transaction model. Right, so could we look at an example? Yeah, so here we've got a company called Field Services, and they've got an employee called Emma. Now, she'll need to be able to access some of those internal services used by her by her employer, um, so she needs to be able to sort of log in and access those. But she also goes off to a number of different client sites and needs to actually access um, services at those um, those partner sites as well. So what we find in the current model is that Emma would log into their field services and she would have um, she'd be a, be a record in a database along with a whole load, load of other employees. 
and then she can access those internal services just fine using that. But when she goes off to a client site, what you then find is that all those different clients would need to have a connection back to the field services data source so that they can actually check to see if you know, Emma's a, a trusted employee effectively. In a decentralized world, what the issuer can do, so field services, they can issue a credential, an employee credential probably down to Emma. She can keep it about her. And when she goes off to one of those clients, she can just present that credential directly to them. Because it's a portable credential, um, they can take the trust from that credential and, and, and allow Emma to access the services on, on their site. Wow, so, so does that mean that centralized databases actually disappear or there wouldn't need to be a connection back to these centralized databases? No, not at all. I mean, it's still really important that an employer knows about all the employees that they have on records. You know, that doesn't change. Uh, what does change, though, is probably just the boundary of how that information is shared and distributed. Mm -hmm. So if we take that example of field services um, issuing out credentials to their employees and then those employees uh, going out to different client sites, that's what we call a bit of an ecosystem that's done to build up there. And anyone who issues a really high value trusted credential as part of that ecosystem, we would probably call that the trust anchor. Okay. And effectively what they're now doing is issuing credentials out that other participants in the ecosystem will trust. Um, and they can even be considered as almost foundational. So you can actually start layering other credentials on top of those. What now are some of the technical components that underpin this ecosystem? Yeah, there's two main standards that we follow in this decentralized identity space. We've got DIDs or decentralized identifiers and also verifiable credentials. So how did DID show up FEMA? Before we talk about decentralized identifiers, let's have a think about what identifiers really are. Um, one of the most common basic form of an identifier is someone's name. So it could be their first name and last name, uh, which is really easy to remember. You can generally remember people's names quite well, um, but we know that they're not going to be unique. And when we're talking about things in a digital context, we really need a globally unique identifier that can identify an exact person or, or a thing. So um, what we find in a digital world is that's where telephone numbers and email addresses have come in really popular. So let's take a telephone number, for example. Um, that is something that's going to be unique, but it's entirely owned by the telco company that you have your service with. So if someone sends you a message, then it will get routed through the telephone company down to, down to my phone. Um, but if I forget to pay that bill for a couple of months, there's a good chance they're going to just cut me off and probably just recycle that telephone number out and give it to someone else, right? And it's the same sort of problem with email addresses, especially those like free personal accounts. So you're at gmail.com and you're at Outlook. Because uh, what we find there is that people will end up with those accounts and those identifiers but then if they ever want to change to another service provider for their email address, then they're not going to be able to. It's actually kind of completely locked in with that service provider. Now, there are definitely people out there who you know, run their own email services and have domains on there as well. Um, but that's not that common, really. You know, it's, not, um, it's not that accessible for most people to be, to be running all of that kind of infrastructure. So what about decentralized identifiers in this model? Decentralized identifiers are actually very similar to email addresses and phone numbers. So they're entirely unique, um, and you can also prove that you have ownership of one. The big difference between that and those existing identifiers is that once it's been created for you, you're entirely control of that identifier. And the way that it works is by using private public key cryptography. Uh, effectively, it just means that the individual, the organization, would own keep hold of the private key, but then the public key is available for other people to be able to prove the authenticity of those interactions. There are actually many different types of DIDs as well. And as long as they're all using the published standards, then we find that they're entirely interoperable. So Emma might get to use a really basic DID as part of her interactions, but her employer, field services company, might want to use one of the distributed ledger-based DIDs, or even there's a way of anchoring trust against an existing web domain as well. So there are actually a few different options in that space. That means that decentralized identifiers are globally unique. You can prove that you have ownership of one, and that they're backed by public private key cryptography. Great. So can we look at the uh, other standard you mentioned, verifiable credentials now? This is the other really important standard that we follow as well. And it's how we actually create credentials that are going to be used into the ecosystem. So the way to think about it is a, is a standard that defines the data model that we'll actually use when we're issuing credentials. It also helps us to find some really interesting properties about these credentials as well. 
First thing to say is that they're all cryptographically signed using the same sort of technology that we talked about in the decentralized identifier standards. Uh, we also see that when they're being issued, you think about a credential, it's probably going to have something like a first name, a last name, maybe a employee number, something like that inside of it. But if the credential is issued alongside one of those decentralized identifiers for the actual subject, it means that we can say that it's been strongly authenticated and subject bound. And that just means that the credential itself has now been issued for that person who controls the DID at the same time. The way that we issue those credentials also means that they've got semantic meaning, which just means that when a credential has been issued by one person and then passed over to another organization, that they will be able to understand what the data types are and it's using a common format to understand what that means. Another really interesting property is something that we call selective disclosure. So if you can imagine the credential being issued with a whole range of different attributes in there, we can actually take that credential and when the individual presents it to someone else, we could just take a subset of those attributes and the credential itself is still fully verifiable, it's still cryptographically signed, um, and it's a way of preserving some of the privacy when those people send that through. Also part of the standard is being able to take multiple different credentials and package them up into a single presentation. And then when you send that through to be verified, then that organization get all the information they need in one transaction. Finally, once a credential has been issued, we actually have a way of issuers being able to revoke those credentials, effectively marking them as no longer valid. And that's done in an entirely privacy preserving a way for all parties that are inside that ecosystem. So now I've introduced those two technical concepts, let's look at how the value shows up for a business. Sounds good. So on the left there, we can see single purpose. This is where credentials might be used in a passwordless logon type flow, but they have a very specific purpose and sort of a point solution use case. Yeah. And on the far right, we've got this whole new exponential kind of trust ecosystem where whole new business models are available and we've moved right up the value curve. And because this technology is so extensible and so modular, you can adopt it incrementally. So first of all, we're going to look at single purpose. Emma, back to our example, how much you use a single purpose credential? Yeah, it's just a really great way to start, right? So the or her organization, Field Services Company, can issue a very basic employee credential to Emma, and she could use that maybe just to log into one system, you know, and it's just that point solution, and it gives you some immediate benefits that you can start realizing straight away. And so from a business perspective, we'd start to see some of those benefits show up and maybe the simplification of the password lifecycle, you know, convenience uh, for Emma and, and reduced friction. Now, if we wanted to add more utility to Emma's credential, we'd have a multi-purpose credential, so credentials with a whole bunch more attributes. That's right, yeah. So a little bit more complex um, in the credential, more attributes in there, and she might want to start using that to log into different systems, probably in, still inside her company, though. Now, we'll issue that credential as a privacy-preserving credential, which gives us that selective disclosure property. That means that she might want to log into one of her systems and only actually expose a certain subset of those attributes through. So from a business benefits perspective, it's far more efficient onboarding. It's going to give you frictionless experience across all those different channels. The form filling nature of all those inefficient processes that take place in business and misinformation, that's greatly reduced. And then, you know, again, improved audit trails and, and compliance. So that kind of comes out of the box. So now if we look at the use in trusted groups, we really start to see these credential ecosystems open up a little bit more and we've got more stakeholders and more actors involved. So some of the partner organizations that uh, Emma's organization interacts with, we can look at how the credentials can cross some of those boundaries. So really just expanding on that example that we talked about just before. So Emma now has an employee credential from field services company. And at some point in the future, she would actually go on like a training course and maybe get issued another certificate, which is in the form of a credential from um, another party. So now she can keep that alongside her employee credential. And then when she goes on site to that, say that high-speed telecom example, you know, one of those client sites, they would actually issue a credential back to Emma as well. So she can keep that now in her credential store. And that credential would allow her to access another site. Um, but for a, in this case, it's for like a time bound period. Mm -hmm. So she goes on site and does the work that she needs to do at that place. Um, maybe probably comes back afterwards and would log that job, you know, just in her usual record keeping system. That system would then trigger her organization, Field Services Company, to send the job completion report through to High Speed Telecom. Once they've received that, they know that the job has been completed. So what they could then do is actually automatically revoke that credential that they'd just previously issued 
to Emma. Um, and that means that she no longer has access to that other site because it was only for a limited time. So you can immediately see that it, you know, enhances the security and you can start building out these kind of quite complex models just using those primitives. Sure. So we can really simplify some of those processes and remove some of the friction out of that journey, as well as the significant customer experience benefits for Emma and the efficiency of the cross-organizational verification. And then you've got some of those compliance and audit trail type uh, efficiencies that you'd enable to. So here's where it gets exciting. So we're actually taking the, the context now to use anywhere. So Emma's gonna to start to use her credentials with multiple different organizations, not necessarily in the context of the stakeholders that she's interacting with in her uh, employment context, but she's gonna use it across her life. So she's got driver's licenses, bachelor's degrees, IRS numbers, all sorts of credentials that relate to her. And so she's gonna collect these from different parts of the ecosystem and present them and people can rely on them. So really the essence of this is about breaking down silos and building bridges between these different stakeholders. So we look here, we can see that businesses who adopt this technology are able to capture a large amount of value by operating on shared incentives and also by working with other organizations in this graph here in an open data economy. The shared identity infrastructure that we're seeing here is sort of the backbone of that, of that network effect and it drives a whole bunch of different benefits for the participants of the network. So users get more privacy guarantees, well, access to secure personal services in a consent-driven way, and organizations get this kind of additive benefit, and it makes participating in the network more accessible for, for both people and organizations as well. So, and finally, as you can see there, we've worked our way up the curve and we're at the top now, so this is the new business model stage. So now that we can use this technology anywhere, the possibilities truly open up in a, in a novel and exciting way. And across enterprises, we can see that businesses drive new value out of credentials, right? There's reduced friction, they improve compliance functions, they enable immediate verification of complex uh, entitlements and claims, they speed up supply chains even, they add value to all sorts of processes that uh, benefit from, from verifiable data. So the, the capability allows businesses to build entirely new classes of decentralized identity services and sort of revenue lines, right? And it also drives value back to the stakeholders. So an individual as a subject now has much more control and agency over their data and they can interact with the, the, you know, the business as a customer in a much more streamlined and kind of user-centric way. So by embracing this change at an enterprise level, you can get started using credentials today without needing to transform your whole business overnight. Uh, and in time, the investment of the, of the infrastructure and the tooling at the credentials level gives you a huge amount of innovation and ability to extend your business models with uh, the digital trust kind of decentralized identity ecosystem underlay all the foundations. It's really exciting stuff, isn't it? Absolutely. And Meta helps you realize all of this value by providing the tools you need to get started. So let's have a look at that now. The Meta 7 platform provides all of the foundational building blocks that can be used to extend, augment, or drive the development of your applications. So we focus on building all of our products with standards um, and ensuring broad ecosystem interoperability. So all of the data models, protocols, cryptography, messaging, storage, all those things that developers don't really want to have to grapple with, we build into a set of really easy to use APIs that people can hit directly. We take all that complexity out of the equation. So that's it from us today, guys. Um, if you'd like to head over to the Meta website and sign up and try this yourself, then you can. There's also a whole bunch of information on Meta Learn, tutorials and concepts and other content. And if you have any questions, you can reach out and email us. So see you in the next video.